All right, so now we're going to talk about altered mental status, or AMS. And as the name implies, altered mental status is any change from the normal mental state. So this could mean really almost anything. So we need to have an organized approach to altered mental status. So let's look at some definitions first. Uh, in order to have normal consciousness, you need to have both arousal and cognition. And so arousal is mediated by the reticular activating system, which is primarily housed in the brainstem. And this is mainly responsible for keeping us awake. And so derangements of arousal can, is what we call delirium. And so arousal can either be revved up or it could be uh, presented as depressed. So when it's revved up, you're going to have people who are like hypervigilant or agitated. And the patients who are depressed are going to be lethargic or stuporous or even comatose. Now cognition, on the other hand, is, is a function of properly working cortical hemispheres, so the cortex. This is basically our ability to think. So derangements in cognition uh, is what we see with dementia. And so depressed cognition could be anything from the ability to uh, not being as sharp as normal, to confusion, amnesia, hallucinations, or detachment from reality. Uh, there's really no such thing as, you know, revved up cognition, because nobody's going to complain that they're smarter than usual. So now let's look at uh, the th these three definitions, delirium, dementia, and psychosis. Uh, dementia it tends to be uh, slow in onset and progressive, meaning it just gets worse and worse with time. The, think of your patient with Alzheimer's, right? They're awake, their vital signs are usually normal, but as time goes on, they slowly get less and less functional. They can't remember your name, and soon they can't even remember how to breathe. It's usually an organic cause, and it's something that's degenerative. Now let's look at uh, delirium. Uh, this is really... Uh, more of a medical emergency. The demented patients, you know, this has been going on for a while and they slowly get worse and worse. But the de delirious patients, this usually happens fast. They can have derangements of both their arousal as well as their thought content. They may have abnormal vital signs or various levels of consciousness. And the cause is usually something reversible, meaning we better do something about it and fix it. Now, psychosis is something that can present similar to delirium, where patients uh, are not acting properly. And it could be sudden onset. Usually their vital signs are going to be somewhat normal. Their level of consciousness is going to be normal, and it may or may not be something that's reversible. However, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. First, you want to rule out all causes of altered mental status that are organic before you're blaming it on some sort of psychiatric diagnosis. This is part of what we uh, are doing when we're medically clearing someone for a psychiatric admission. We're looking for all the potential organic causes of delirium that might be presenting like psychosis. So the first thing in your evaluation of the patient with altered mental status is to perform your primary survey and your initial actions. And we're going to go with uh, our A, B, C, D, E like we did for trauma. One of the most common causes of death from altered mental status is loss of airway protective reflexes. That is, the patient will aspirate because they're so out of it. So make sure, if you need to, that you intubate these patients. And with airway, you should always think of of a, a C-spine immobilization for in case trauma is one of the causes. So put them in a hard collar if you need to. You're not going to be able to clear this person's cervical spine until their mental status is back to normal. And so if you suspect trauma at all, put them in a C-collar. Supplement their breathing with 100% oxygen, either by a mask in the delirious patient or an endotracheal tube in your comatose patient. Now for circulation, remember that hypoperfusion of the CNS can result in altered mentation. So be sure to treat circulatory collapse appropriately. Uh, put two IVs in, start them on IV fluids, and give them pressors as needed. D stands for disability, which is a quick neurologic exam, just like we did in trauma. And so use your GCS or your a AVPU, AVPU score to get a quick uh, neurologic exam. And look for a movement on both sides of the patient. Maybe they're not moving one side. This is really a stroke or maybe some spinal cord injury. And so include that in your neurologic assessment. And finally, E is exposure. Undress your patient fully. 
and do a quick head-to-toe exam looking for any signs of trauma or any patches, like transdermal drug patches they may have on them, or obvious infectious sources. So just like trauma, we had our A, B, C, D, E primary survey. Now for our initial actions, we're going to look for reversible causes, and we're going to use our coma cocktail that we looked at in TOX as well. So that again spells DON'T, and that stands for dextrose, oxygen, Narcan, and thiamine. And you don't have to give all of these things to everybody like we used to when we call it a coma cocktail, but you have to at least consider them. So maybe for dextrose, you get an AccuCheck and make sure the sugar is good. You uh, put, check a pulse ox or, you know, we're probably as we did in breathing, we're going to just put them on 100% oxygen. Narcan, look at their pupils. Do you think this is an opiate overdose? And thiamine, if this is perhaps alcohol-related, you might want to give them some thiamine. Now let's move to the differential diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis for altered mental status is huge. You could see this giant table, which I got here, from www.cdemcurriculum.org. CDEM stands for Clerkship Directors in Emergency Medicine Curriculum.org. And you can see that lots of things can cause it. There could be structural problems like tumors or bleeding, uh, metabolic problems like hypoglycemia, uh, hyperthyroidism, medications. It's a big cause that could cause it, like steroids, it could be anticholinergics, alcohol, infectious causes. There's a ton of stuff that could do it and uh, a lot of other things things that cause you to be in shock as well as psych issues here now this table is very cumbersome to remember so let me show you how I remember it so the differential diagnosis for dif for altered mental status there's a mnemonic A E I O U tips and let me tell you what all those stands for so A stands for alcohol so you may have a patient who's drunk or maybe you're not sure that they're drunk so you might want to send an alcohol level E stands for epilepsy. Perhaps they're post-ictal, or maybe they're having subclinical status epilepticus. That means they're having status, but they're not having outwardly obvious convulsions. The other E also stands for endocrine and electrolytes. Maybe they're having hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, like thyroid storm, which the uh, defining feature is the altered mental status. Or maybe they're having some sort of electrolyte abnormality, like they're hyponatremic. E also stands for uh, encephalopathy. So maybe they have some liver disease. I stands for insulin. And this could be hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. Maybe they have DKA or a hyperosmolar non-ketotic state. Or maybe they just, blood sugar is just too low. O stands for oxygen. And for opiates, and we already talked about this a little bit. The U stands for uremia, and renal failure, renal failure is a rare cause of uh, altered mental status. T stands for trauma, and trauma could mean that maybe they have some sort of intracerebral bleed, or maybe that they're just in shock, that they're hypotensive, and so they're not getting any blood to their brain. T also stands for temperature, so they could be hyper or hypothermic. Maybe this is heat stroke. The next I stands for infection. And this could be a CNS infection like meningitis or encephalitis. Or it could be a systemic infection like a UTI or that causes urosepsis or pneumonia or sepsis. Uh, P stands for poisons. And this could be street drugs or any other kind of uh, exposures like carbon monoxide. But it also could be their own medications. Maybe they're not taking it properly. Maybe they're taking two of a pill instead of one. P also stands for psychosis, but remember that we're going to use this as a diagnosis of exclusion. It's on our differential, but we are not going to stop at psychosis until we have at least considered all the other things. And S stands for shock. Remember that any circulatory collapse is going to compromise blood flow to the brain and therefore cause um, changes in mental status, so it could be shock. S also stands for stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and space-occupying lesion. And so what's happening with these things is, yes, of course, it could be a huge stroke which is causing it, but also the, the increased pressure that these things cause is going to affect the cerebral perfusion pressure. So remember, cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the mean arterial pressure minus the ICP, so the intracerebral pressure. So if this ICP is increasing and this is staying the same, that means the cerebral perfusion pressure is going, is going to be decreased. 
So let me put that a uh, different way. So if the pressure in here is just increasing, you have a lot of pressure, a lot of ICP, then the mean arterial pressure is not going to be able to get blood flow into the brain. So the cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be down. It's not going to get in, uh, the blood it needs, and that's going to cause altered mental status. Now, this differential diagnosis here, this is the key to everything. This is what's going to guide our management as, that we need. So, again, remember, A-E-I-O-U-T-I-P-S, A-E-I-O-U tips. So now let's move on to our secondary survey. And getting a history from a patient with altered mental status is obviously going to be difficult. I mean, by definition, their mental status is not intact, and so they really can't give you a history. So make sure you go to other sources. Ask their family, their friends, any caretakers or nursing home workers. Call the nursing home. It's important. I've never got useful information from them, but I always call them just in case. These are invaluable sources of information. So some questions you're going to want to ask. First is, what's different about this patient? Uh, maybe this isn't even altered mental status. Maybe she just has pretty profound dementia. We want to make sure that this truly is. Uh, some sort of altered mental status. And then you want to ask, when did it start? Remember that delirium tends to happen pretty quickly, and dementia is a slow, progressive course. And then look for some of those, the most common causes, the first in elderly, the most common causes is a medication error. So ask if there are any new medications, or are they taking it differently? And if they're in the nursing home, though, it's Usually the nursing home, people are going to be giving them their medication, so it's not going to be meds, but it'll be an infectious source because they're going to catch it from other nursing home patients as well. So look for any infectious sources. Are they coughing? Does their urine stink? Are they vomiting? Have they been complaining of belly pain? And then any trauma, did they fall and hit their head? So these are all important questions you want to ask. Now let's move on to their physical. And let's go head to toe. Of course, first we're going to start with the vital signs. Are they tachycardic? Are they bradycardic? Or is their respiratory rate off? Are they hypotensive? Or do they have a fever? So these are all things that are great uh, help in, in making our diet uh, differential. And then you want to look at their neurologic status. Are they alert? Do they notice that you're even there? Are they answering your questions? Are they able to stay focused or even able to stay awake? Then do a neuro exam. Are there any focal uh, findings, like motor findings, like they're not moving their leg? Or are there any cranial nerve problems? Then next, do a cardiovascular exam. Are they an AFib? Could they have thrown an embolus? Do they have a murmur? Is this endocarditis? Then next, listen to the lungs. Is there a pneumonia? Do a good belly exam. Is their liver big? Are there any signs of liver failure? Is their belly tender? Maybe they have mesenteric ischemia or they ruptured a AAA. Then make sure that you look at their bits and pieces, right? Do a GU exam. Uh, is their urine stinky? Do they have D-cubes around their buttocks? Or do they have a bloody stool or melanot? Do they have a vaginal infection? And then do a good skin exam. Uh, are there any track marks that make you think that there's any drugs? Are there any uh, rashes? Are there any patches on them? Are they jaundiced? Are there any signs of trauma? And so you want to do a good head-to-toe exam on, on these patients. They're not going to tell you much, so your physical is going to be very important. Now on to testing. And our strategy here is not to shotgun it and order everything hoping we're going to find something, but instead to use our differential diagnosis to guide us. And so again, we're back to our A-E-I-O-U tips. Well, let me fill these in. So now let's go through these then. So alcohol, maybe you want to get an alcohol level if they're not obviously intoxicated. Maybe you don't need one, but maybe you do. And maybe you want to send a serum osmos if they took some other kind of toxic alcohol. For epilepsy, if they are seizing subclinically, uh, I might pr I'd probably give them a trial of a benzodiazepine to see if that works, but maybe you call neuro and you get an EEG. I'd probably also send drug levels of all their anticonvulsants. For endocrine, you know what, I'd probably send the TFTs, the thyroid function tefts, tests, because maybe this is thyroid storm, or maybe it's adrenal insufficiency, so you send a cortisol level. Pretty much everyone is going to get a chem panel uh, to check their electrolytes. And for encephalopathy, encephalopathy, you want to check their liver tests, their LFTs, as well as an ammonia. For oxygen, we're just going to put them on O2, but we'll probably also get a pulse oximetry as well. And for opiates, you could check a UDS. 
S2. Uh, uremia, we're going to get a BUN and creatinine uh, with our chemistry. Now, for trauma, remember we said this could be two things. It could be hypotension, so we're going to treat that. But it could be some sort of uh, intracerebral in uh, injury, so you're going to get a CT of the head. And we talked about in our primary survey that you have no idea to know if their C-spine is injured. If they hit their head, they could have hurt their C-spine too. So I'd put them in a C-collar, and I'd throw on a CT of their C-spine as well. Now for infection, you're going to get your standard things, looking for fever sources like a CBC, a blood culture, a urine, a urine culture, and the chest x-ray. If you're worried about meningitis or encephalitis, you're also going to want to do a lumbar puncture and send off the CSF. One point I'll make about this lumbar puncture is make sure you do the CT head first because maybe it's increased intracerebral pressure causing them to be altered. If you do a lumbar puncture without knowing that, then you could potentially cause them to herniate. So this is one time I would do CT first and then your lumbar puncture. Uh, poisons, I would send off drug levels of anything that they're on. So if they're on lithium, send a lithium level. If they're on digoxin, send a digoxin level. You may as well already send the urine drug screen and alcohol level as we talked about. Psych, that's our diagnosis of exclusion. Shock, well, one of the causes of shock would be an MI. And it's not necessarily a silent MI. They just might not be able to tell you because they're altered. So I'd probably get an EKG and a troponin on these patients as well. And then for our space-occupying lesions and strokes and subarachnoids, uh, we are going to get our CT head that we talked about already. So now you can see that we have a pretty uh, organized approach using our differential diagnosis to decide what we're going to order. We're not going to shotgun it. We have an approach, AEIOU tips. Our differential is guiding us. Now as for treatment, again, we've kind of talked about this. A lot of these things are going to be happening concurrently with our evaluation. Like we'll be giving dextrose if we need to oxygen, Narcan, and thiamine, our uh, coma cocktail. We'll be giving IV fluids. We'll be treating any hyperglycemia with insulin if we need to. We'll be hanging empiric antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics, to treat any potential infectious sources. If they're hot, we're going to want to cool them. If they're cool, we're going to want to warm them. You're also going to want to control their BP. If it's too low, bring it down. If it's too high, bring it Wait, if it's too low, bring it up. If it's too high, bring it down. Uh, you're going to want to treat any seizures with uh, benzos if necessary. Che you know, treat any electrolyte abnormalities, maybe hyponatremia, with some uh, saline. And obviously treat any of those causes that we found. If it's an MI, treat that. If it's a thyroid storm, you're going to need to treat that. If it's uremia, you need to get them dialyzed. Almost everybody is going to be admitted that comes in with altered mental status. Now, there are a few exceptions. If you have a patient with known seizures who had a seizure and they came in and they were postictal and then they woke up and they were appropriate and you check their levels and they're fine and you talk to their doctors and you make sure they're not going to drive or take baths, you could send them home. You have a hypoglycemic patient, maybe a diabetic who forgot to eat today and took their medications and gave them a sandwich and now they're doing better and they promised to take their meds, they can go home. Maybe the intoxicated patient, the drunk, who after a long, long time of watching, wakes up, shows no signs of DTs, no signs of withdrawal, and you say, okay, fine, they can go home too. But pretty much everyone else is going to stay. And the question is, where do you want to put them? Put them on the floor, put them in the ICU, and you're going to ask yourself a couple of questions. How sick are they? Uh, is this cause easily reversible? Did we figure out what it was? Did we fix it? Is the patient back to normal? Uh, how likely is this thing to return? Like maybe they uh, took a whole bunch of uh, hypoglycemics and so now we keep giving them sugar but they are going to uh, become hypoglycemic again because the medications are still hanging around. If they need to be watched closely, put them in the ICU. If you just kind of want to keep an eye on them, maybe you can put them on the general medical floor. But I would probably err on the side of caution. These are tricky patients, and so uh, be careful with them. And so that's it for altered mental status. Uh, remember, AEIOU tips, that's our key here, our differential. Post any questions you might have in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye.